everybody's having an unbelievable start to your week. Uh, hopefully you had a great day today. Um, it's almost 5 o'clock p.m. where I'm at in the office. I've been going for a while. It's been a crazy day. Uh, you know, I've been kind of away uh, enjoying baby on our anniversary and um, got back into the office. There are some things that have to be done. Got some things going on that are extremely important, so we've been grinding all day. Uh, but I want to stop in and talk to you about something that was thrown across my desk in the form of a question. And I answered it, but I thought it'd be a good time to talk about it. I've been sort of alluding to it for a while, and I think I want to address it just briefly because I want to start laying uh, some context to some things that I'm going to be sharing with you moving forward. Before I go any deeper, I would like to remind everyone that we are in the process of a fundraiser for those of you who believe in the work we do at the Odyssey Project, whether it be through programs like Black Men Lead, Restoring Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, uh, Black Empowered Ini Empowerment Initiative, Music is Life Initiative, or whether it's the research center <clears throat> that we operate, or uh, a number of other things that we have done. Uh, we've now moved into the realm of providing and offering and facilitating uh, a number of mental health services and some other things. But if you believe in the work we're doing, uh, we definitely would inv uh, invite you to show your love and support. Go to the description box of this video and you'll see the ways that you can support the work we do. On that note, I'm uh, moving on. Someone asked me, had I noticed that a large preponderance uh, of the commercials being shown on television today have interracial uh, interracial couples, biracial interracial couples. And I've noticed it, I've noticed it for a while. I've talked about it, you have to excuse me, my voice, I've been going for a while. I had a couple of long uh, sessions and phone conversations dealing with that, so my voice is a little beat up, but <clears throat> The uh, simple answer to the question, yes, I've noticed it for a while. I've had some conversations with some of my colleagues, uh, some people that I felt could understand what was going on. What you have to understand, it's real simple. Um, the Caucasian population is dwindling. <coughs> Simply put, white people are not procreating at a rate that will uh, support their current majority and the current uh, size of their majority. They're shrinking. <coughs> Excuse me. They're shrinking while other people are, other groups, especially uh, Lat Latino groups, and blacks are growing. And you have to understand that there are a number of different ways to protect your interests. Um, and it gets it gets kind of deep, but it, uh, on the surface it's real simple. Okay, if we are losing the race as Caucasians, uh, and the alternative is something that we don't control, uh, we start to promote interracial relationships, and then what we do with the interracial relationships is we create an entirely new race. So it stops being biracial at some point, and then it becomes a classification of a new race, or it comes with the options that you see many Latinos with. Well, Latinos now can choose to whether they are white Hispanic or Hispanic with African origin. And obviously, there comes benefits with that, right? So what you have to understand is, as we start to push towards what used to be a long time ago, simply known as mulattoes, but now it's biracial, it's interracial, and it has structure and it has purpose and it has intent. Nothing is ever done on a grand scale like you're seeing without there being intent. There is far too, the, the idea of interracial relationships is far too invasive in commercials and movies and so forth for it not to have a purpose. So you have to ask yourself, what is the purpose? Uh, the fear, uh, no matter what, 
despite the fact of blacks being passed in this country as the largest minority, uh, which you have to be careful in how you use that word, but we're not going to get into that, but by uh, Latinos, uh, predominantly Mexican, but uh, some Latinos from other areas um, south of the border <clears throat> and for them, uh, certain Caribbean countries predominantly are making up these, you know, Cuba, uh, uh, the Dominican, places like that are making up uh, a significant amount, obviously Mexico, and then moving in from Central America and South America. Uh, it's happening. And so they are now the uh, a percentage point or so ahead of blacks as far as the size of their population. Now, and that's only because, again, the Latino community has been given the option to choose of whether they want to be classified as uh, Latino of African descent or Lat uh, Latino uh, Caucasian descent. And obviously, j even in the sense of just mind, people think white is better. So if I get a chance to choose, I choose what I think is better. Uh, not necessarily because it's accurate or true, but because I think there are certain advantages that come with it. I'm, I'm shooting for this privilege that everyone says doesn't exist. Well, what happens is when you start having biracial, you start having conflicts of cultural interest. You start having issues in which people are confused about what they should identify with. See, uh, when <clears throat> there was a predominant white race, uh, and the white race as a majority wasn't threatened, uh, it was okay at that point to declare that if you just have one drop of black blood, you're black. If, you're, if you weren't purely Caucasian, um, then you weren't Caucasian. And over time, there has been a need to classify other ethnicities uh, not necessarily races, but other ethnicities as being classified as white. Uh, in, initially, Italians weren't considered white. Uh, initially, Jews weren't considered white. But as there was a need to maintain the idea of a majority for multiple reasons, there have been these uh, genetic and social compromises to how we're going to classify the white race so that there is always an image of power by way of majority and convincing others how to do it. And what you have to understand is racism has always not been the primary element or component of the end game. People confuse that. People think racism is the end game. Racism is the gatekeeper to something much more powerful, elitism. Elitism is the protection of the powerful and the extremely wealthy. And it is done through a number of means by which the wealthy are protected by buffer groups. One of the buffer groups are white middle class. As the white middle class begins to shrink and other middle class groups begin to grow, there's a need to grow that out and to express it. So I see <clears throat> biracial, interracial relationships uh, producing children who will be uh, either neutral in their mindset by way of that and probably identifying with whatever is convenient, um, especially in situations where black women wear, marry into uh, a white family. By that way, children tend to automatically adapt to the dad's culture, uh, the dad's identity. The men carry a very powerful force in the way of identity. You see the same thing happening in Nigeria, where China is literally sending men into, into Nigeria and marrying Nigerian women. Uh, what happens here is the child will be raised as, a, uh, as, as Chinese. They will be raised under the China, China, Chinese culture because they will be raised uh, under the culture of the father, who in their culture is the head, is the leader, is the source of identity. But what happens is when you create an entire generation of children who have uh, African mothers but Chinese fathers and have dual citizenship, all of a sudden you have an entire new race of Nigerians that will operate in the interest of China. And it is taking place in such a rapid rate, it's unbelievable, but it's happening. And it was predicted a while ago when the, when the infiltration first started. It is a, a very old strategy, thousands of years old, uh, but it's obviously still effective when necessary. 
And so what we're seeing here is it happening in the U.S. Uh, through the push of interracial relationships. Uh, there's also a push, obviously, of uh, gay relationships. Um, I think beyond what can be considered uh, the actual population representation or percentage representation of gays in the community. Uh, but that's not the point here. <clears throat> the point here is um, what is simply being put and presented as uh, diversity um, and an acknowledgement of diversity and an acknowledgement of a quote unquote uh, colorblind society is really truly a push uh, for the, the promotion of uh, mixed marriages and biracial and interracial marriages for the purpose of creating a new buffer zone for white elite, elitism um, and the wealthy elite and ultimately uh, the, the extreme upper class, um, upper middle class to upper, upper class will benefit from it. We have to be very careful. We have to be very careful in acknowledging this because we need to be strategically prepared to how we're going to deal with this. Um, a lot of people really and truly get very uncomfortable when I begin to talk about this because they feel like I'm talking down to them or I'm judging them. I'm not telling anybody who you fall in love with. I'm telling you that who you fall in love with has further implications than your choices of who you're going to spend your life with. Uh, there are a number of different factors that go beyond simply choosing someone within your own race. I personally have made a choice that I would not marry outside of my race. Um, that's a very educated choice, but it's been probably that way my whole life. I mean, I've been in situations where I've been exposed to a lot of people that don't look like me in a time with a lot of, when a lot of people who didn't look like me wanted to get with me because of where I was, who I was, and what I was doing at the time. And that's just one line I've never crossed. Um, you know, uh, my thing isn't judging anyone. My thing is to give you uh, the knowledge and the education of what happens. See, the thing is, as a person who has spent a lot of time under, it, practicing uh, research in the sense of scientific method and understanding the importance of numbers, uh, what we call quantitative uh, data, things that can be measured, things that can be counted, things that have a very precise image and can be reproduced uh, through replication of whatever method was practiced to come up with the numbers is a part of scientific method. And so uh, with that being said, the one thing I understand is anytime something is statistically significant, then there has to be an explanation for that statistical significance. And, and statistically, something's, whether something is statistically significant or not depends on what it is. What is the probability of something happening coincidentally in that particular sense, in that particular state? And so when you start to talk about going from uh, a predominant uh, market in which um, couples were normally coupled with like uh, partners, as far as race is concerned, um, to moving to a very intensified surge that can be measured and you know over a very short period of time a very strong shift in that there's a cause for it it doesn't happen by coincidence it isn't just okay you know people are looking at it the reflection people say well it's just reflecting society or is it or is society reflecting the influences uh, you know that's a question that's something that has to be answered and not from a place of superficial observation. It has to be looked at. It has to be examined. There have to be studies. But what I can tell you is when you have something of this significance, it's a cause behind it. And so some will argue, well, it's a push for acceptance in diversity. I think that there are some cases for that. And again, my issue isn't judging anyone who has chosen to do whatever. Everybody has personal reasons. Everybody has personal situations. Not everybody comes from a certain situation or a certain environment or is in a certain environment. There are certain people who are simply exposed 
to different situations and though that exposing them puts them in a situation where they're more likely to choose a certain type of mate. Again, I'm not here to judge that. What I am here to say is we've got to be very careful and aware of how this thing works. Uh, one of the problems I think that we have is that it's easy to sit up and to make certain accusations or make certain proclamations that we're in a post-racial America without looking at all of the different policies in place, all the different things that negatively impact blacks or impact blacks in a different or disproportionate, uh, disproportionate way uh, than any other race. And it just sit up and say, well, you know, if this happens, if that happens, how can it possibly be a racist culture or a racist society? And it takes uh, a trained eye to understand it. You know, it takes a trained eye to understand how to observe policies. For instance, if you go into the legal academy, there's definitely an issue in the legal academy. If you go into the financial uh, spectrum, there's definitely policies in place that have uh, a different impact on one group than it does the other group. And so you have to have, again, answers to why that is. And if you're not willing to delve deep enough, then you're not ready to have that conversation. And it, it's not for everybody because it's not about how you feel. It's about what you can literally sit up and uncover and present and prove. And my thing is, it's just a pattern. You have to see it. It's, it's also, it also can be followed and researched in history. It's a way of using biology to control a narrative. And the thing is, if my numbers are dwindling, then I have to find ways. And there are a number of different things that have been pushed. Even the, the gay agenda is pushed heavily with that in mind. Um, there's so much lost when the traditional family is spurned. Um, and there's so much energy and effort put into being politically correct and not stepping on any toes that we lose sight of the things that's best for not just ourselves uh, but for the culture, for the future, for the future of our children. Um, there's so much t uh, turmoil. It's so tumultuous right now on a social level. Under just understanding uh, what is, what isn't. Um, you know, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what, we sh what should we be doing, what shouldn't we be doing, uh, is that right, is that wrong? And uh, the, the goal is to be politically correct um, with disregard to whether or not it serves the, 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 the interests of a certain group or not. In, in, in our case, our interests. So then what? We sit up and we uh, accept behavior, we promote behavior, we even defend behavior that probably will not serve us well over the long haul. Number one is very few have taken time to project what it means. What it means, see, there are certain realities that come from these different types of situations and uh, choices when you choose to make a certain move, you commit to something. And then um, one of the things that we don't want to talk about is the transference of wealth. It, when you're talking about building black wealth, because whether you want to admit it or not, groups in this country operate in enclaves based on race and culture. Asians tend to work and deal with and build with Asians uh, Jews with Jews, Latinos with the Latinos, and whites own the system, so they benefit automatically. The problem is that blacks have not. Well, when we're talking about building collective black wealth, we have to protect the wealth we have. The problem is when, say for instance, uh, a black athlete who has a $50 million contract marries a non-black wife, and something happens to that wife, what are the chances of that wealth remaining in the black community? And it, 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 there's possibilities if they have kids and those kids identify as being black or the mother identify those kids as being black and I have friends 
uh, who are married where the man is black and the woman is female. female. And what t tends to happen a lot with white women who have kids for black men, if they have a son, their entire mindset changes because they understand that nobody's going to look at that son when their mother's not around and know that that mother's white or even care. At that point in time, that son is black, and she knows what that means. So she starts to think a little differently. She starts to move, and the identity is different. So in that case, you never know how that's going to unfold. But generally speaking, the way that you protect that wealth is by keeping it within the collective. And most people say, well, nobody controls who they fall in love with. One of the biggest misconceptions about marriage is marriage is about feeling and emotion. Marriage has always been about the institution of building and perpetuating an idea, a value system uh, beyond yourself. It, it is about a way of protecting one's interest and creating the environment through which one can successfully build that which they desire to have. It is a business agreement as much as it is an emotional uh, connection. And one of the problems that we have is we connect often out of emotion and we fail to properly and adequately measure uh, and evaluate that relationship and we end up in situations that don't work and we end up with kids in households with single parents uh, through multiple parents over time and that doesn't work well as well with building uh, wealth. Having children out of wedlock is, an, a, taxing, is a taxing thing on, fi on your finances uh, especially for black men. So Again, that's this problem, but uh, also what you have to understand is groups within groups are often used as buffers. For instance, the white middle class has always been a buffer between uh, the impoverished class and the predominance of blacks and the wealthy elite. But also, what used to be known as the bourgeoisie class, extremely wealthy and highly educated blacks were also used as buffers between the wealthy elite and the blacks. And so you have to understand the history of that and understand how it works. And sometimes we are too busy working against one another to see what the enemy is on the outside doing. Money, the wealthy elite is always looking for ways to protect itself. The wealthy elite own the six mo most powerful media entities in the world. And thereby they control the message. The message will influence you if you are sitting up and consuming it. You will stand to believe and to t tend to move along with the predominant message in the narrative of what media is presenting. It's simple. Edward Bernays told you about this in his book, Propaganda. Uh, Tom Burrell told you about this in his book, Brainwashed. Both of these men were exceptional in what they did in the marketing and branding industry in the ability to convince the masses on what to do and to the point that people were thinking they were making decisions what they were actually doing what uh, those who control the media message was want, were, were wanting them to do. And so again, you have to be aware when you see something of this magnitude that there's something behind it. And it goes a lot deeper than what I've been able to deliver in one message. But like I said, I'm laying the context for what I plan on dropping on you over the next you know, few weeks. So with that being said, I'm going to get off of here and let that marinate for a while. And then I'm, I'm, I'm going to co keep coming back. And I'm going to keep sharing some things with you. Uh, feel free to leave your comments, share what you think. Please, if you, if you disagree, disagree. As long as you are respectfully disagreeable, I have no problem with people who disagree with me. I encourage it. It challenges me to be on my game. It challenges me to be able to uh, effectively defend my position outside of my emotion and my personal feelings. Uh, personally, I really am the kind of person, if you good, if you good, I'm good but it might not necessarily work best if I'm saying I'm pro-black to take that stance. And so from a position of pro-blackness, I have to speak on things from that position. 
Uh, it doesn't mean I don't love you. It doesn't mean that I ain't good with you. But I'm just speaking in general. A lot of people get offended. Like I said, I have friends. I mean, friend, people I literally consider friends who are part of interracial or biracial, biracial relationships. And I love them to death because they've been true to me. But they know how I feel about it. And I, I don't have one of them that takes issue with it because they know me. You know, I have kids that don't really move uh, the way I want them to sometimes. Does it, does it mean I stop loving them? Of course not. I love my kids no matter what. Doesn't mean that I'm going to bend who I am to fit where they are. It means that I'm going to accept them and love them because they're mine. But I'm going to be honest with how I feel. And I can love you and not agree with you. And that's what we've got to get as a people is being able to say, you know what, I ain't feeling what that is, what you're doing right there. But you my dude, you my you my friend, you my you my homegirl, you my my sister, you my brother. And we we're gonna get through this together because not we're never gonna all be on the same page. And if we keep waiting for that, we're gonna keep losing opportunities. And that's what I don't want to see my people do. On that note, as I said in the beginning of this video, if you believe in the work we're doing, please go to the description box and choose one of the ways that are available to you to support the work we do. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have a